This is the stuff of nightmares. You're the passenger in a small plane when the pilot collapses at the controls and you are going to be forced to land despite having no flying experience whatsoever. Well, for John Wilde here, that scenario took place for real last October. His chances of survival at one point put at just 30%. He defied the odds, though, and managed to land the plane safely. His story has now been made into a documentary. And he's here. John and the air traffic controller who helped talk him down, John Cameron. Um, thank you both for coming to see us. It's an extraordinary story. It is the sort of thing that, that people dream about in their worst nightmares. And particularly difficult for you. You've been out with a friend in this plane right, yeah. for the day and then he collapsed. So you had to deal with that, the fact that he was first unwell and then you knew that, that he died. And then you have to deal with getting the plane down in one piece. That's right. Well, all sorts of things must have run through your mind. I can't repeat him on screen. <laughs> <laughs> no, you probably can't. No. Um, the first thing you, I mean, you realised he was ill. Um, what was the first, you, you first of all, one of the main things you did, the most important things, was get in touch with other people. Well, in actual fact, I pondered a bit because I was hoping that he was just like he had before. He was unconscious. Right. And he was going to come to again, but he didn't. And I kept nudging him and I tried to find a pulse, but not being a doctor, I couldn't find it anyway. <clears throat> and then I thought, well, I'm going to have to talk to them somehow because I couldn't change frequencies because I didn't know how to change the frequencies. And we were going from the Humberside part to the Doncaster area. Um, then I saw the Trent. I thought, I'm going to have to do it. I gave him another nudge. No. What's the Trent? It's Trent a river. river. OK. <laughs> I see what you mean. Geography 101. <laughs> you seem to know about, a bit about geography. Um, so you, you got the call, Mayday. Um, when you hear that there's somebody flying the plane, in charge of the plane, who's got no experience, what were your immediate...? You're thinking that one minute it's going to be OK, next minute it's going to be a large burning crater in the ground. It could have just gone straight from stabilised flight to unstable and uncontrolled spin into the ground. So yes. at any moment it could have changed from speaking to John and then to not speaking to John. You made a calculation when it first started, saying, right, we got a, about a 30% chance here. At one point, though, that went down it's, to a 5% uh, chance. That's Why was that? Five percent is, uh, when John was making, I think, his third approach, uh, he's watching on radar, his altitude dropped by five, 600 feet. And even a trained pilot could sort of might not be able to recover from about 400 feet, 500 feet above the ground, but he sort of certainly was less than 10% down to 5% with regard to the fact that he actually recovered the aircraft to uh, to make the final approach to land. Um, John, what's really striking about this, from the very moment you first make contact with air traffic control, is that you may have no flying experience, but you are immensely cool under pressure. Um, I was doing too much to really panic at that time. Um, I was trying to keep the thing level and got in a direct line and uh, looking to see where I was. And I was also trying to see if he was still coming to or not. Mm. Yes. And uh, particularly difficult because uh, the light was going and you couldn't turn on the dashboard lights. Yeah, I didn't know where it was. <laughs> um, and I didn't think about that until we got to Humberside when um, it, the, the sun decided to pack it in and go home. And it was so dark I couldn't see how did you know? How did you know how high you were then? I knew while it was daylight because I had the altimeter at what I call half past five, half past one. That's the little hammer's on one and the big hammer's on the 55, which is 1,500 feet, and I was trying to keep the airplane at that height. Um, but when it got dark, I didn't know what I was. And of course, I'm going to have a bit of drop or even climb, depending on the currents of the wind. OK, so there's so many, so many things you have to think about. You've got a, a, somebody who, a flying instructor, didn't you, to help you? Yeah, when you, you ring around, you think in the airport you'll be able to find a pilot. It took us about 20 minutes to locate a pilot, then another 20 minutes to get the pilot to the airport. Right. Um, so I've got three other members of staff working, uh, sort of like heaven and earth, sort of to get everything rolling. And it's sort of like 40 minutes later, Roy was able to sort of come in and. Uh, then you had to change runways because the wind was was being was different. The time of day, the light, each, the wind direction, all sorts. It, the clock was ticking. Each um, decision we made could have gone either way. And so we initially opted for the short runway. It was into wind, uh, but we had a seven-minute window uh, to make the approach. But. He sort of, the, uh, the approach was just slightly off kilter, so we took the option to send him around, but it got too dark, so we had to put him on the lit runway, which created a crosswind. And you'll see on the programme, he hits, when he lands on the runway, the aircraft does drift to the left, and that's a crosswind just pushing him off the runway. So you it's not John's fault or it's a wind. No, I mean, an incredible landing. Um, you landed the fourth time round. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it must have been a desperate situation to have t tried three times and not made it. Well, I hadn't paid me insurance, so I had to keep going. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, was, I couldn't see, and I didn't know how my position was, whether I was level, yes. tipped or anything, because there was nothing to relate to. Right. And that was what caused me the problems.
mm. and I didn't know how high I was, what speed I was going. I knew I had to get it down to about 60 to have a good chance, mm. but I didn't know I was going enough. In fact, somebody on the radio said I was doing about 70 plus. Had you been in a small plane before much? Oh yeah, I've been plenty of times. Okay, so you knew your way, and, and that particular aircraft? Yeah, um, I hadn't been in that one before, but, but I've been you, in similar types. So you were familiar Roughly more they or are less. the same, because they're like uh, sports cars, they've got Somebody's had a mess about with them and put things here and put things. And you've taken, you've been allowed to take the controls before for. A On bit. the way out, um, my mate said, you, know, "You hold the controls a bit and get used to it." And he says, "You're holding it too heavy." So he says, "Lighter, lighter, mate." So I did, and then on the way back, he said, um, "Take the controls for a bit, John." And then we see head it towards Doncaster, and we did. Um, then he had his first uh, attack when he had a hyperventilating, and I let him go. He took, came back to. And then he, um, he said, uh, I said, you're right. He says, no, I feel sick. He says, and you're off course. So he set us up back on the course, and he had it for a bit. And then he said, take the controls, John. And we'd just gone past um, Hemswell on our star a port side, and there was Gainsborough's coming up shortly. And he said, take control, John, and he had a, his attack. Mm. What did you, what was your job? What? What your actual job of <laughs> back in the day? Because you okay. seem to have sort of you know experience. To I'm be able retired. To... Yeah, I know you're retired <laughs> what now. What did you do when you were working? Uh, as little as possible. <laughs> when, when I left the air force, I uh, had enough the work. Air force, oh, you clue. see, you uh, no, see, I had enough work. I yeah. thought I'll watch work, and that's much easier. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I mean, extraordinary, extraordinary story. How many people would have been able to land this plane like John? Do you think? Uh, very few. You, know, you get the people that you control the form room saying, "Oh, Microsoft simulator, you can land the aircraft." But totally different environment. It's going dark. You sit on the wrong side of the aircraft as well compared to what pilots normally sit on. Anyway, but it makes you think. Actually, before you go in a small aircraft, just for fun, might be an idea to try one of those simulator games. So if the worst was to happen, mm -hmm. you're not entirely at a loss. No. When I asked him, had he had any flying experience, and he said, "No, I thought I was clutching at straws. Maybe he'd been in." Simulated being down the slots down Blackpool Pleasure Beach playing on the video games, but no, got nothing. There's nothing. <laughs> to, uh, there's much. no bone it's thrown at me in that one. So anyway. just, uh, okay, Lovely John Cameron, John Wildy, thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And the documentary Mayday: The Passenger Who Landed a Plane is on Channel Four tomorrow night at nine.